So welcome back everyone. So Karen Alim will give her second talk on the physics of flow networks. Karen. Okay, cool. Um, so um, just a short recap. Yesterday I introduced you to um, the uh, flow networks in the big systems, showed you how they are adaptive and actively and having flows feeding back on the shape um, and derived Taylor dispersion with you. I today sent VJ uh, my lecture notes from yesterday, and today they're in one document attached uh, to each other. Um, so ideally, you can you can also follow um, the blackboard on, on the notes. So um, you can struggle in the notes, or you can uh, look at the um, like add to to the notes I sent you. Um, today, I want to, uh, yeah, we derive Taylor dispersion as a hallmark for describing transport in flow networks that are typically built out of long slender tubes. Um, but we still remain on a, in a setting where we're looking at flows in a single tube. And so today is going to be about really looking at the dynamics in a network. So we're going to talk about flows in networks. Um, so, you know, if we think about a network, um, it's, a, you know, some setting of tubes. Um, and so we can discretize it uh, by describing each tube as an edge. Um, and these edges are connected in nodes. So I'm going to use lettering for the nodes here, J and K, and I'm going to use tall Greek lettering for the tubes, like um, I. So nodes, J, K, and um, ed edges or tubes, for example. Um, now, as we said, we, we're going to look at uh, systems that are at low Reynolds number or um, strictly speaking, if we have low, um, long slender tubes, uh, low Reynolds number, like Reynolds number itself, which um, does not need to be, which um, quant quantifies the amount, the impact of inertia, which is limited at low Reynolds number, can even be extended so that you have always a condition of laminar flow. Um, and so because of the no slip condition, the standard flow profile that we used yesterday is per se flow. So um, in every tube, so as a reminder, the flow profile looks like um, two U bar, U bar being the cross section average. Um, along each tube. Um, where the cross, the cross section average flow velocity that we derived yesterday was given by radius squared eight divided by the viscosity and the pressure gradient. Now, um, there is um, a direct analogy between electrical circuits and flow networks. Um, so uh, that's all on the basis of flow velocities versus some flow rates. So the flow rate in um, um, in uh, flow networks corresponds basically to current in uh, electric circuits. Um, so the flow rate Q is pi a squared u bar. Um, and so for Poisson flow, um, you see that Q is then, if I just plug in uh, pi a to the how four a mu um, PDZ, and now I'm gonna write the PDZ in a um, in a discrete form. So I'm gonna write delta P over the length of the tube on delta Z L. And so now um, you see the full analogy to electrical circuits. You have your current here, and this is your um, voltage difference. So pressures belong, uh, correspond to voltages and flow rates uh, correspond to currents. And then what you have in the middle is what you can identify with the conductance um, 
of your the capacity of conductance in the in the network in the flow uh, in the electrical network in the flow network you don't know this as um, C tube capacity and so uh, in retrospect you can also define the resistance of a tube that will be then one over C and so um, if we just plug this in quickly we see uh, very much in our intuition that the resistance of the tube um, to like so basically you have a tube you apply a pressure gradient and you measure um, how much flow do you have and so if you have a tube with small diameter you have a low flow um, uh, and the same is true if you have a long distance to cover um, and so we can now generalize this to just write down for any tube in a network Um, you have now the, the flow along the tube connecting nodes J and K um, that's proportional to the capacity of this tube and the pressure drop between the two nodes. And now this is the building block to go ahead and write down uh, flows in a network. Um, and it's basically built on Kirchhoff's circuit law, again, very much reminiscent of uh, electrical circuits, uh, which is nothing else than conservation of volume. Um, and, and so I can now write down um, the flow at node k, for example, the sum over all flows going in has to be equal to the flows going out. So whatever flows in um, has to flow out again. Flows in equal what flows out. So I can write this as the sum over all flows um, JK, where now J are the nodes, the LDs, um, leading up to K. So J is nearest neighbor of K in the network. This sums up to the residual flow at this node. So I define this as um, let me define this as I K. Sorry, maybe I shouldn't have called the tube differently. Let's call the tube uh, whatever um, alpha. Um, so that sums up to the inflow at the tube or outflow at the tube uh, node. Um, and now this is equivalent to the sum here. J nearest neighbor K, PJ. And so now uh, we can see that um, given the um, given the flow rates and the capacities, the pressures are fully defined. Or vice versa, if you know the pressures and you know the contactances, the flow rates are fully defined. And, and so that's basically, that's the essence of calculating flows in the network. So this equation that we're going to write down as an example um, for a small network so that you can see how you really work it out. Um, uh, so the set of PJs, the set of pressures and, and flows uh, in a longer tube is fully defined by knowing the capacities and the inflows, for example. And so, for example, if I now were to, if I were to calculate, um, say, flows in the Fazaro networks, I know that there's no extra inflow or outflow at the nodes because the 
the flow is only flowing in the tubes. So I know the, the um, sorry the I k's. These are these are zero, and I know the capacitance um, of each tube, which is just a geometric quantity. It's the viscosity, the tube diameter, and the length of the tube. So I fully know these, and based on these two, I can really calculate the pressures and it's during the, the uh, flow rates along every tube. Um, so as an example, let's look at a simple network of three nodes. One, two, three, four. And we'll just write this down as a matrix. Where basically on the left we have the inflows at the nodes. And this is now proportional, and I'm just spelling out these terms here uh, as a function of the pressures at each node. And so uh, node one is only connected to two, so I get a minus along the diagonal, and I get a plus here, and then zeros for the other entries. And the same is true for the four, uh, the two, the, um, these two, the node four and node three that are um, straightforward to fill in, uh, two, three. Uh, two, sorry, two, three, yeah. Um, and now here I have a longer term because two is connected to each of them. So I have a C1, two, I have a C2, three, and I have a C2, four, and along the diagonal I have them all. So this is just spelling out this equation um, in matrix form. Uh, but it's instructive to do so as an exercise because you quickly observe that the system is um, overdetermined. The rank of the matrix is zero. Um, so what went wrong, right? I can't, I can't invert the matrix as it's written here. Um, but there's nothing wrong. It's when you think about the physics, it's perfectly fine because um, what we have here is that we're writing down the system as a function of pressures. But actually, physically, what's only defined are pressure gradients. So basically, as in electric circles, the potential is just at only the the different the gradient of the difference of potential um, of uh, voltage is, is defined, but not the absolute value. And so, um, you basically have one pressure that is free to choose. And so, uh, you can just um, if, uh, choose one pressure equals zero as a reference pressure, say P P4, um, that's an arbitrary choice, uh, which essentially deletes that line. And then all of a sudden, um, you're basically now defining your pressure relative to pressure four, which is pressure zero, um, and then you have a, a matrix that you can perfectly invert. And so, um, to rescue System being overdetermined. Um, and so now you can uh, directly calculate uh, all the pressures from the inflows that are given at the nodes. That, for example, for a closed network would be zero, um, or yeah. So, like any if any arteries would be zero. We're going to revisit this, a different system that are plants where you actually have flow rates um, that are exiting or entering um, these nodes. But you can also think about these flows as like if you have a node in the middle of the network, there's no external flow; it will be zero. But if it's the inlet, like you know the uh, artery connecting to the heart, then this will have a value. Um, so you, you specify this, you know all the capacitance from geometry and you calculate the pressures. Um, and then from the pressures, uh, calculate by inverting matrix. And then when you have the pressures, 
and you can calculate, you can basically plug it back in here and, and then calculate the flow by basically uh, taking the partial difference um, along the along the respective two. And so basically now you're able to um, if you if someone gives you any any network um, and also specifies you what your boundary conditions are, which is the inflow rates and the lows, you can straight calculate um, the flows in the network. If you have questions, blackboard keening might be a great time to ask. Um, and so now that we're able to calculate flows um, in the network, we can ask ourselves what are sort of, you know, are there design principles to flow networks? Are there, um, um, uh, are there uh, like physical laws that hold uh, and describe living networks? So this is actually a very old question um, that goes back to um, Murray, um, and it's actually called Murray's Law, even though um, in the physics le lecture, um, the law suggests that this is, you know, um, this is true and proven by first principles. Um, but in this case, it's really more a heuristic geometric law um, for uh, vascular networks that uh, is not derived from first principles, but is more a hypothesis that what, how it might describe um, networks. And so that goes back to um, actually two papers that are published back to back by Murray in PNS in 1928. So it's about a central question. Um, and so Murray wondered how you know, are there, are there um, physical principles that, that describe our vascular networks? And so he started out with the hypothesis that um, if we look at, uh, at a network junction in the, in the network, then the wall shear stress at the node um, at the, node should be, at, the, at the node should be constant. So that basically there shouldn't be any discontinuity if I think about um, the branching um, in the network in the, in the shear stress. And the idea being that the network self-organizes to make sure that this is true. Um, and so derived from, you can basically, based on this hypothesis, you can derive a geometric law for um, the, the geometry of vascular networks that you then go, can go in and test. And so uh, the wall shear stress is actually defined by uh, the gradient of the flow profile. So um, T equal mu the fluid viscosity du dr r equal a. And so we can work this up for a lot of soil profile to find um, a. Um, now written in terms of the cross-sectional flow velocity, but I'm going to rewrite it now um, in terms of flow rates, because for flow rates, Kirchhoff's law holds. And we know that whatever flows in needs to flow up. And so um, I'm uh, just um, multiplying by pi a squared both both ways to find then q pi a to the q. Now 
I can, I'm going to rearrange this term as a function of Q, and I'm going to write the flow rate as a function of the wall shear stress. So then I get for Q um, minus pi, whoops, pi a to the cube tau um, divided by 4 mu. And now I can make use of Kirchhoff's law. which states that in this tube where I have fluid coming in um, in branch one and spreading out along branch two and three, or let me call them zero to make sure that this is the inlet, uh, we know that Q zero has to be equal to the sum of the other outflowing flows, that's just conservation of volume, and so now if we plug in that we can write Q as a function of the wall shear stress, we find the shear stress in tube one um, and the same just copying now for the other tubes. Now, you can rapidly see that um, if you assume that all she shear stress are, um, are equal and that also it's the same fluid and hence the flow viscosity is equal, then this term drastically simplifies because I can you know, cancel out the pi's, cancel out these. And then I can also cancel out the, the shear stress because I'm assuming that the wall shear stress along the node is constant in each, it's, a, it's the same um, in every node. And I arrive at a law stating that um, radius cube of the inlet is equivalent to the sum of the radius cube of the two outlets. And that's what's called the Maris law. And, um, it's uh, been found to be surprisingly universal so throughout, um, throughout, the, throughout life, basically, uh, because it holds for um, animal vasculature uh, that also has been shown to describe valve plants or even cymals. Um, so, yeah, you know, that suggests that maybe there's really like universal physics that are governing these systems that are bi biological makeup are very, very disparate, um, but still um, obey the same physics law. And so you find um, that these geometric laws that you can derive from these principles um, describe the system uh, very well. Now, what is interesting is that there's yet another way to derive this geometrical relation starting from a different hypothesis. Um, and, and this is taking us a little bit on the, on the stage that maybe vascular networks um, evolved to optimize their function. Um, and so that's the first, also the first idea of how um, this came up, also um, going back to Murray about 10 years ago. So the same functional dependence um, can be derived, um, um, arises from, arises from minimizing a cost function. Um, and so, the, the cost function, the idea behind it is that basically um, the network is uh, minimizing frictional dissipation, um, but they have a constraint that is volume cost that goes into uh, building it. So, um, first of all, to write down friction dissipation for, for soil flow, Uh, 
Um, this is so the um, the dissipation again, same analogy to um, flow networks where um, dissipation would be resistance times um, uh, um, current squared. We now have R Q squared, and we can plug in the R that we have on your notes, uh, which is basically if you remember eight mu L over pi a to the fourth um, times two squared. Um, and now there's some, uh, Mara assumes that there's some metabolic cost um, that is proportional to the volume of the tube. So um, that's basically spent on uh, generating the material that your blood is made of. Um, and so the volume of the tube is just pi a squared over L, and so Mars cost function then arises to be just the sum of both of them. Um, this is just a parameter. Um, And that's the metabolic cost. It is proportional to the blood volume in this case. I mean, this is a stage where you could already start arguing why, why would you take the volume um, and not say what actually is uh, taking energy is like building the tube wall and you would have a difference a scaling relationship because it would be would be too high a times l. Um, so you already see that setting writing down a cost function is actually um, very heuristic, right? You, you can you could you could write lots of different cost functions, um, and that's that's actually something that um, you should also be in mind that when you sort of write down a physical cost function ad hoc and then look at the dynamics, you're going you, you're doing a, a vertical exercise, um, but you're basically imposing um, an assumption that this might be important for your biological specimen on the specimen with, without having, um, you know, asked life if this is what they really care for. Um, but it's a good exercise because it might stir um, thoughts of like how the system is working, and you have uh, you make uh, predictions that you then can quantify in your data and then see to which extent. Then the session holds. So um, that I'm saying that because I personally um, have evidence in in Fasarum that we have instances in in the course of the um, in the life of my, our networks where it seems that Maris law really nicely explains the uh, describes the network architecture that we observe. Um, but that's not true throughout life. Um, and there are other stages where it really doesn't do very good. It doesn't do a good job, right? Um, and so it might very well be that uh, networks have different functions and being sort of very efficient and transport by not wasting uh, energy on dissipation by the flow um, friction on the tube wall may only be good for some instances. And that is also an idea that's uh, rooted in when we look at vascular networks, where also the idea is, well, you know, maybe um, there are types of vasculature um, which where Marx's law would not hold because it has a different, another task is much more important to optimize for than being a very efficient transporter. Um, but let me um, go on and describe um, the dynamics that would follow from this cross touch. So. Can? Uh, how does one come up with the time scale in which this uh, relationship holds? I mean, in which this uh, the the sum of the cubes that you showed. 
yeah. there, there should be a time scale within which uh, this will be achieved, right? So, for example, uh, so so you this mean is coming. Sir? I mean, you saw all the system holds, right? I mean, in, in every time point, whatever, uh, because whatever flows in has to flow out. That's like really basic physical concept. But you mean at what time scale the the network sort of adapts to the arrive arrive at being um, like having the same shear stress or like optimizing this function? Uh, no, I mean like let's say uh, I join three pipes of equal radius, uh, yeah. and uh, and then if if this network has to uh, optimize the flow, then then it will start. Uh, one tube will start growing and the other two will start shrinking, right? That's what yes. I understood from this. Yeah, yeah. There will be a time scale within in which this uh, oh. the, the, this adaptation will will occur. Yeah. So that's what uh, we assume. Yeah. There's no data. Like if you ask me what the physiological time scale would be, this is uh, this is really a theoretical hypothesis. And uh, the way Mars law so far has been tested is really looking at basically you take a resin of a vascular network. Um, so basically you have a, a 3D static image and then you just quantify um, the vasculature, the radii, and then you make statistics on that. But it's one snapshot. There's no dynamics in time. And the only data how um, Mars law, and that's why I was so cautious saying, like, you know, it's not a physics law. Um, it was very right that they, uh, for example, uh, took an NML and they clocked um, a specific artery and then observed, uh, like, half a day later, how did the arteries in the vicinity rearrange due to, you know, one tube having been clocked. And um, that was in line with the shear stress um, driving the smaller tubes to grow because the, the flow rerouted. And um, but again, that's like a you know one time point to look at, and we don't have the, the time evolution because that's uh, that's uh, more challenging. Um, there's more recent data on uh, um, uh, zebrafish development um, where you can do live imaging because you have a transparent embryo and. Um, which is even more puzzling in this context because there we see uh, instances where, for example, the shear force, uh, like the flow rate in a in a vessel, goes up. Yet the entire vessel shrinks in diameter. So that's entirely counter to what Murray's law would suggest. Um, and so I believe that really identifying what the biological, uh, what life is really doing, is looking at the dynamics and um, and. Uh, and really looking at how the dynamics, how the dynamic, the laws of uh, the physical principles of how tubes respond to whatever um, input there is um, and decide to dilate or shrink. It's most likely that this is really a physical coupling because we do observe Mars law across um, so disparate biological um, specimen as animals or plants, um, but um, it's uh, I'm, I'm not entirely convinced that Mars law is it, but it's a, it's a good hypothesis to start thinking, and, um, and it does describe, in my, in my opinion, it, it actually works reasonably well to describe basically um, the flow uh, from your heart to your limbs, like on the first order, um, where you really care about being efficient. And as I said, we do observe it in, in some ones as well, they are really into rapid motion, they obey Mars law, but if they don't, if they're not into like rapid motion and reshuffling of flow in a one specific location, they might not so much care about this. They have other um, uh, functions to optimize for that we don't know. But I'm, I'm going to give you later on in today's talk um, a little bit of a of a glimpse of what other hypotheses are around. Thanks. Um, okay, so let's work out what. Um, so now we take. With these cross correction, and we minimize um, with respect to A. Um, and so that's brief A algebra that tells us um, for any cubed A to the 
eight, five, two squared, and so this should be zero now. Um, if, the, if the radius optimizes to minimize the energy, and so from that again, I can solve for the flow rate in the tube being equal to um, two kV pi a l a to the six um, eight mu l pi. I can oops, sorry, pi goes up. Uh, I can chain simplify two things, um, and then I can use this to write down. Uh, this is still squared Q, so Q, sorry, Q is then the square root of um, and then a Q. So again, you see that uh, based on this very different approach, I um, arrive at the flow rate being proportional to the radius cubed. And so again, if I um, Again, use Kirchhoff's law and a node and write down that Q0 is equal to Q1 plus Q2 um, and all the parameters being, uh, being the same, you see that I arrive again at um, um, sorry, these are meant to be A's, sorry, A um, at uh, Mars law. And it's actually not so surprising because dissipation is proportional to um, the shear, that's basically the shear force uh, of, um, of the fluid on the tube wall is what's giving rise to dissipation. So, yeah, that's why it's not super um, surprising. Um, yet, this formulation of thinking about it as a fact cost fraction really triggered a whole body of work that I um, would like to um, to tell you a little bit about, which is basically thinking I about minimal... Hmm? Uh, yeah. I have a question. Uh, Q is also a function of A, right? So are we assuming that yeah. Q is kind of constant here? Um, I put in that... So, um, no, the Q is, a, is in this setting, is a, is a boundary condition. Like you have a tube, and you have an inflow Q that flows through the tube. Okay. Um, and so that's, that's a constant here. Um, it, but it's a good point that when you're dealing with flow networks, um, you have the possibility to have two different boundary conditions. Um, namely, one is uh, boundary conditions in terms of flow rates. That's what I used here. Or um, you can have boundary conditions in terms of pressures. And since um, the flow is proportional to the conductance times the pressure drop along the tube, you see that these are entirely different uh, boundary conditions. And it's um, and so whatever resulting dynamics you um, or you know whatever transport flows you calculate strongly depends on which boundary conditions you choose. So I should have specified here that this is a, a, in a, a flow rate boundary condition compared to, compared to the pressure boundary conditions. Typically, I personally find it easier to think in flow rates um, rather than pressures that are, yeah, right. Also the kappa or the k that you've written over there, the, the yeah. it, it's a biological uh, constant, right? So yes. it depends. Yes. It's a, it's a parameter. You can, you can actually think about it as a Lagrange multiplier in a mathematical term. Like you're minimizing that given that you want to keep um, this con as a constraint. I mean, this is basically the way it's been reformulated in recent years. Yeah. So uh, that also would cancel out uh, for all the Q0, Q1, and Q2. Uh, yes, I assume that this, this, the metabolic rate for building your blood is the same for every tube. Okay. Along and then all this, yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, so, independent of like thinking about biological networks, and uh, this something sort of gave rise to a whole body of work on minimal dissipation networks. And um, because you can, you, I mean, you can 
think about uh, right, uh, designing uh, a markedly big device and you would be interesting in like, making it efficient. I'm just giving a few references here, um, but there's, there's even more to be found, um, but this is a good starting point. 277, then there's Croissant, and apparently PIL is the, the place to publish this work, it seems. Um, um, and so they, it's basically starting from this, but writing it in a more general form. And so um, writing down a cost function that is now the sum over all links in the network, kj, um, flow rate squared over conductance, this was resistance, resistance one over conductance, and just adopting um, the nomenclature you will find in these publications. Um, and now you switch from this kappa to uh, a proper Lagrange multiplier with the constraint um, that um, you want to have your conductance to the power of gamma fixed. Um, so that's minimizing dissipation um, with the constraint um, of like a fixed building cost. I'm just specifying as K. So you have a certain amount of material, big K, um, and that's, that's fixed. Um, and here now, this is Lagrange multiplier. You can still find um, your equation on the left by, um, for, for soil flow, if you write down the conductance, that's um, just the inverse of the above, so you have pi a to the fourth um, a new L. So um, if you want to um, basically recapture Marie's law, um, where we, here we have a scaling of A squared, that would correspond to choosing with the conductance of the Poisson flow, gamma equal a half, um, given that all tubes have the, the same length. Um, that's for Poisson. It's um, in the literature, sorry, uh, gamma is kept as a variable because you can also describe electrical circuits, for example, where you would be at gamma equal one. So it's a more general formula to describe um, networks in general. And so now we can go on and minimize dissipation um, in this framework. Um, and it's actually very, I mean, it's one of these rare systems um, where you can actually, it's actually numerically very, very efficient. Um, 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 and by generating your own uh, minimal dissipation networks uh, is really an exercise of writing code of like 10 lines, um, which I find, you know, particularly beautiful. Um, that, um, and it's basically because you can directly solve uh, for the Lagrange multiplier here. And I'm quickly going to show you um, the trick of how to do that. So that if you were interested, you can um, uh, really calculate um, uh, your own minimal dissipation network and model at their uh, beautiful structures that I will only scratch out, but you will find beautiful examples in these publications. Um, so again, we, we take the derivative with respect now to the capacitance um, of this equation to find QKJ squared uh, squared minus lambda gamma CKJ gamma minus one, and that that will be zero. Um, and so I can now rearrange this in terms of minus lambda gamma uh, 
plus one, so I rearrange that one equal. And I'm doing that um, because I know that this constraint is true. So um, I want to include this constraint explicitly, and so that's why I rearrange this equation by um, uh, multiplying by gamma over gamma plus one, so that this becomes c k j to the power of gamma as here, and we do the same here. Because now I can perform summation, and I directly get the sum over c k j uh, to the power of gamma, which I know is k, um, and so. I have an additional equation that basically reads um, that k is equal to the sum over all kj's um, and now I can use this to um, directly solve um, for um, the dynamics of my ckj um, and I'm using uh, this, this term. So I'm rearranging this equation, which is and divided by this expression, but I know that this expression is actually that one divided by k. Um, uh, sorry about this, uh, c to the gamma, and now I multiply with 1 over gamma, um, and um, so I now have an explicit expression of the conductance um, as a function of the flows um, in the network. So I can, this allows me to very uh, quickly find the minimum numerically. So basically, you, you take a network, um, and uh, a typical uh, boundary condition that is used in these kind of networks is to sort of assume um, the flow dynamics of a leaf. So in the leaf, you have the water coming in from the roots, up the trunk, into the leaf, so you have one inlet, and then the water is actually um, evaporating um, a small um, stomata, like small holes, uh, that are uh, basically more or less uniformly distributed throughout the leaf. So you have, as a boundary condition now, you can go back into these eyes, high case, you have one inflow boundary condition, and then every node in this network is um, an outflow boundary condition that um, uh, is uh, set up so that the inflow I in is equal um, n, where n is the number of outlets times i out. Um, and so basically now you can find the minimal state by just drawing a random set of um, conductances of these, of these uh, tubes in the network. And you have the conductances, you specify the in and the outflow, so you, you invert your matrix, you find the pressures, from the pressures, you get the flow rates, and then based on the flow rates, you can directly um, find the minimal state of these conductances. And that makes it numerically very, very easy to find states, and further on actually enables you to, to go some distance analytically. And so um, it's actually been proven by Bohm and I that in the setting of um, uh, with these boundary condition, the minimal dissipation structure is actually a tree. Uh, okay, believe me, I'm trying to draw a tree. So, as I said, like the beautiful um, graphs you find in these. Um, so, the solution is a tree. And there's been uh, more work um, by Casson and Catafiori published back to back where they looked what actually happens, say, if I change my boundary conditions in the sense that the, the outflow through these, these holes and leaves to the stomata is fluctuating over time. Um, and it turns out that uh, this was a, a very inspiring idea because if you have these fluctuations and you minimize the function, 
given that these boundary conditions are fluctuating over time, you um, get loopy structures in the network, um, which is very reminiscent to the um, main networks that we observe um, in leaves, where we indeed find loopy structures. Um, and so that is concluding on um, minimal dissipation networks for now. Um, and I would like to squeeze the remaining, yes, okay, okay. time to now um, uh, sort of ignite another idea in your mind of what uh, living flow works, networks might care for um, by going back to transform equations. Um, because, at least to my mind, um, I mean, it's good that flow, net well, you know, flow networks are built to be efficient, but I mean, they're really in place in most settings because they're meant to transport material from A to Z. Um, and so it's, it's another um, inspiring theoretical perspective, perspective to now say, okay, so what, uh, what follows uh, from um, now looking, taking the perspective of that the networks should be doing well for transport. And so this is now inspired building on yesterday's lecture where we looked at um, Taylor dispersion, but now we're going to look at transport and absorption. So basically, um, uh, now we're looking at a, a tube where there's some inflow of material and the material is uh, transporting some, some goodies, say some um, glucose, oxygen, um, and what happens is that this, this, this glucose is being absorbed at the tube wall and provided to the tissue. Um, Basically, if we go back to the, the plant, that's what the plant is doing. It's taking resources from the soil and it transports them up to the leaf. And um, the leaf spits out the water through evaporation, but it keeps the goodies that are being transported with the flow and uh, provides this to the tissue. And so to describe these now, we have, an, again, an infection diffusion equation um, that we're adding absorption as a bounding condition. So again, we have dc, dt, but now the bounding condition is that at the boundary dc, dr, we actually have um, uh, in absorption that's proportional to the concentration of particles at the boundary. And that's your absorption rate uh, parameter. It's called parameter because it's in the time scales. Um, and so um, if you now look at flow with absorption, um, bear in mind that flow and, and concentration now decouple. And knowing the flow doesn't tell you yet at all either, uh, about um, the concentration since um, what uh, is absorbed upstream is not available downstream. And so this already states that there's an interesting puzzle, right? Because um, how, do you, how do you set up the network so that also downstream does get the goodies, whereas um, you know, if everything is absorbing, or all tubes are absorbing, then there is a competition because those that 
you know, get the highest concentration, they take up some of the goodies, and then less is available downstream. Um, and so now the, the way to solve this is to go um, and, and do some maths. And so basically ask how does flow um, uh, influence absorption? Um, and this is actually this this fluid uh, physics literature on it because it's basically the same. The name is of looking at heat conduction, and there's um, there's a nice uh, explicit solution by Longo and Moffat. Um, but it's uh, uh, it's not a closed form that you could go on and do analytics. So the uh, alternative, and that's actually now going back to um, work of one of my students, um, and that's in the void sock interface last year, is that you do the same trick, um, kind of tailor the tailor dispersion trick, um, and write down your concentration as C bar by the variation and also your flow field as the cross sectional average and the variation around it. And now you basically do the same dynamics, yet with these different boundary conditions. And so I'm not going through the details of the derivation again. I believe it's in the appendix of, uh, or the supplement of the, of the paper. But I'm just going to give you the result. Now for the cross sectional concentration, where the terms look different, because now, A, you have a loss term in the beginning. That's your loss term. That's A. And then you have an advection term that is also modified by um, absorption. Um, and that's in itself an interesting um, observation because you see that the higher, if you have an absorption rate, it actually increases your flow velocity. And that's again, you basically take away the slow particles, and so the net transport seems to be faster um, of the cross sectional average, because the slow ones are the boundary. Um, and the same effect you observe for um, the diffusivity. Um, and the reason I'm actually specifying these dynamics out is for you to, to appreciate that um, although these terms look a little involved, involved um, you can still write them down and you still have an analytic expression. Um, I should state that we use uh, similar approximations compared to approximations. Compared to yesterday, namely that we're looking at the long time limit, so where um, advection is dominating over diffusion and on the cross section, that the cross section average is larger than its variation. And as a new constraint, we're using that gamma times A is small. This is stating that you have a, a small absorption parameter um, um, and that ensures that basically absorption doesn't change your uh, variation of your concentration field a lot across the cross section too drastically. If you, have, you would have strong absorption, you would have a strong variation along the along the cross section. Um, and now the beauty is you can go on and you can, um, for example, solve for the steady state concentration profile. Um, and so, so steady state means that um, the time evolution um, is done, so dcdt is equal to zero, and then we have um, an ODE for c as a function of z, um, and so 
we'll make the standard ansatz of an exponential function um, initial condition at the start of the bound of the tube minus um, beta, oops, sorry, z over l across the tube. And um, this answer results in a quadratic uh, equation for beta. And the solution for beta is uh, can be written down as 48. Um, where actually in the course of deriving this, the trickiest thing was to find a closed, uh, closed way of writing the sound by identifying the dimensionless variables that are actually of meaningful potential. And so these are the dimensionless variables that you see here. So what is a times gamma? So gamma has the um, dimension of a one over um, space. And, and so that specifies your, um, your absorption parameter, as specified down here. And, and then there are two other ones. One is actually super well known, that's PE, that's the Peckley number. Um, it's a name after Peckley. Um, and that describes, um, and you should encounter this again if you do fluid physics, the ratio of diffusive versus advective high scale. So the time to diffuse um, across along the tube is uh, the length of the tubes divided by the diffusivity, molecular diffusivity, diffusivity and, and the time to be affected would just be um, uh, the distance via my velocity, the cross-section average velocity. And so if I now take the ratio, I find um, T diffusion versus affection, the um, one L cancels, and so this is L U over kappa dimensionless property, um, and you should generally keep in mind that um, uh, Peckley, if you have a small Peckley number, your dynamics, your transport dynamics are diffusion dominated, and if you have a large Peckley number, you're attraction dominated. Um, if you really care about transporting stuff, you would like to have a large Peckley number, because this is for rapid transport. And then the other parameter, that's S here, that's actually in spirit what I found in retrospect, similar to a dump cooler number. Um, that's something that we probably haven't come across, and it's the ratio of the time um, scale of absorption divided by the time scale of advection along the tube. And so basically to be absorbed, <clears throat> you first of all have to diffuse along the cross section to reach the boundary, and that time scale is given by k um, over s squared, and then you have to get absorbed, that's the absorption parameter, and then you divide by your time scale to be transported, and that's again L over U bar, um, which again results in a dimensionless uh, quantity. Um, and then I should specify that here we assumed um, I, in the answers I have um, an initial concentration C0 um, that is being um, in the beginning. Um, but for most, if I really think about my plant and I have an inflow of fluid, then I actually have a flow boundary condition um, rather than a C 
uh, like a constant concentration upstream. So the boundary condition that I'm using here is actually a flow. So um, I, that means that C0 is specified by um, my inflow J0 into the tube. Now flow of um, fluid with con like the constant, like the particle inflow, um, divided by um, advective and um, diffusive transport. And now um, this tells me that I can quantify, like I can specify the um, the concentration decay along a tube, basically due to whatever is um, absorbed upstream is not available downstream, that's why I have the exponential decay. But um, what I can do with it is, in addition is that I can really now calculate how much is actually um, absorbed in an entire tube. I'm sorry. So now, based on this decay, I want to calculate the absorption along an entire tube. And so, uh, this the absorption, so phi, I'm going to denominate it by phi, and that's basically the entire along the surface S of the entire tube, the uh, flow of um, concentration across the tube wall. And um, this uh, you can actually solve because we have in the steady state, we have the concentration profile. Um, and then you, in, in the first instance, you have a very long expression that you can simplify um, a little bit by um, looking at the proper um, uh, important limits, and so you arrive at something that looks like um, pi a squared j naught times comma l a u. So basically, it's a product of two terms. One is saying that the amount that gets absorbed along the tube is a function of A, what flows in. So that's my inflow rate um, uh, times the, the surface, uh, the cross section of my tube. So that's the total inflow, influx. And this I'm going to call the absorption capacity of a tube. So basically, as a function of what flows in, this, this specifies how much can be taken up. And so this is already a very instructive result because it tells me that um, if I have a high uh, flow rate, then the flow velocity is high flow velocity. If the high flow, the, since the flow velocity is down here, above, then I actually have small absorption. So um, I have low, small absorption. So what's going on there? is basically if you have um, if you flush your material through the tube very quickly the particles have no time to diffuse to the boundary to get absorbed and so you're not actually doing well in providing in, in supplying um, your, your tissue around you um, whereas if you have low uh, flow velocity then you have high absorption And that's sort of, you know, if you take the limit of basically no flow, basically you, you have uh, whatever is coming in is um, 
has infinite time to be absorbed at one point, so everything is going to be absorbed. However, if you also have low flow versus low inflow, then you don't have much coming in. So you see that this is intricately coupled. And to make this um, more, um, give this, put this into meaningful uh, model, we're going to look in a, in a, at a minimal model of a leaf. Uh, um, it's basically a 1D model that's connected tubes. Uh, and it might seem very minimal to think of a leaf as a set of connected tubes, but it turns out basically the, the poor, well, no, this wonderful student of mine, um, he actually ran the simulation of an entire network and looked at the supply in, um, in a leaf with a reticulated you know, beautiful network, and it turned out that um, he didn't have to do it. It's all in the scaling relationship that we're going to derive in the next couple of minutes. Um, and that perfectly fits the simulations um, that you actually don't need to do because it all describes what you see in, um, in the network. And so basically the setting for the leaf is, um, in a 1D setting, you have a tube, let me just draw this a little bigger. You have a tube, um, you have some um, inflow into this tube. Um, Q in, or I in, whatever, Q in, and that's flowing in. And then you have these stomata, like these where the fluid is flowing out, right? So after, say, one tube, I have a little bit of um, fluid going out, but no, it's just the fluid, it's not the particles, right? You're just basically reducing the pressure along the, um, along the line because the rest of the material is flowing further up to the next stomata, where again, I have the same fluid evaporating and so on. And so you can, I can basically write down a whole uh, segment of tubes of total N where uh, the fluid is flowing along. Now, the fluid that comes in comes with the goodies. Um, so let me just quickly state what I wrote down here is that Q in is equally um, uh, partitioned um, along all these, these holes, all these stomatas, so all these Q outs, which for N tubes is actually N times Q out, because we're going to use this. So now, if I want to look at the, the profile of um, my absorption along those, those tubes, um, um, what we see is if we have very um, low flow velocity, then low flow velocity means that we have high absorption in the beginning. And so what's absorbed in the beginning cannot be, is not available downstream. So basically the amount of um, uh, goodies being absorbed per tube segment successfully uh, always goes down. Whereas if you look at the, uh, sorry, the contrary case of high flow velocity, I, um, I have very uh, small absorption in an individual tube just because it doesn't have time to get to the tube wall. And so um, more and more, like, so it doesn't take away as much in the beginning because you have low absorption. And so um, as the flow velocity goes down because the fluid flows out, um, the flow velocity goes down and actually my absorption goes up towards the end. So now if, we, if I look at these two graphs, it, you know, okay, so they have one state where a lot of is being absorbed in the beginning of my, my one dimensional network or I have the other state where a lot of being absorbed at the very end of my one dimensional network. And so this suggests the idea that maybe there's an optimal flow velocity um, for homogeneous absorption, where basically all, um, all two walls um, take up the same amount of goodies and um, are therefore also supplying the cells around them with the same amount. And that might be desirable. And so let's now derive this optimal 
uh, flow velocity for homogeneous absorption. Um, so basically because we have inflow and outflow at every node, there's a continuous decrease along the tube. Um, and we can write this down in general for any tube segments, but it's basically instructive to just look at um, the very first tubes, one and two, and ask ourselves what conditions have to permit that these two tubes have the same amount of um, um, absorption across the entire tube, um, and then this actually is the is the general result. So I can write down um, the flow rate in um, tube one is uh, equal to the flow rate in, in, in tube. Sorry, the flow rate in tube two is the flow rate in tube one minus um, whatever flows up. Um, and I actually know what this what flows up. That's actually a function of what flows in. So that's Q1 minus um, Q in over n. And I actually also know the Q in uh, Q, the Q1, which is basically Q in. So I actually know that Q2 is Q in one minus one over n. And now I can use this. Um, to also um, calculate the flow velocities in the tubes, because in the end, the flow velocities are the ones that are determining uh, the amount of absorption. So I know my, my U2 is the flow velocity in the first tube, and so that's Q in over pi A cubed, uh, A squared, and I assume that all tubes have the same radius A. Um, and then it's minus uh, minus one over n um, q in over pi a squared, so that's basically again the same. So my I know my u two and um, and, I'm, and and I know my u one q in over pi a squared. Um, and so now if I want to look so I can basically specify the absorption capacity given that I have the flow velocities, um, but now I also have to specify the amount of influx. And so basically what, um, what flows out can be absorbed in the next two. which basically states that um, u out of 1 is equal u in of t. Because only the, the, the fluid uh, like goes down, but not the flow. So you can basically now make a, um, so tube 1, the amount that gets, gets absorbed in tube 1 is basically the amount that flows in, so pi a squared is zero, and um, times the absorption capacity of my tube one. Now, this is what's absorbed, um, but I'm also interested of what's flowing out. I want to determine this. So, flowing out in tube one is basically what flows in this here, minus what's being absorbed. So that's basically pi a squared j0, 1, that's the whole thing that's flowing into the tube, minus what's being absorbed. And then it's straightforward to ask what happens in tube 2, uh, what is absorbed in tube 2. And so that's then what flows in times the capacity to absorb, the absorption capacity of tube 2. So this is what flows in, um, and I should multiply it with the absorption capacity of tube 2. And so now asking uh, what is the condition for each of them absorbing the same amount is just saying that I want to state, I want to set equal what is absorbed in tube 1 
to what's absorbed in tube 2. And I know this. It simplifies, and now um, I have to plug in what I know about the flow velocities to simplify these terms. So that's my absorption capacities. Um, A and my U1 was Q in over pi A squared plus 2 comma comma L equal 1 minus and the same. And um, now the same for um, the second tube, where the flow velocity is decreased. So I have this 1 minus 1 over n term here. Uh, 2 gamma. Now, um, this simplifies here. Um, this term also simplifies drastically because I can um, multiply this by this denominator and then the gamma 2 gamma kappa L term sort of cancels out and I'm left with the next line which um, is basically this simplifies to A over Q in pi A squared times this term that I can then this denominator is the same as this one so these two cancel out and I'm left with an equation that states um, basically, um, so I'm, I'm left with 1 equal a q in pi a squared times this um, term on the right, where the 1 over n term comes in. Uh, um yes um and now you see that basically there's a linear relationship for q n q q in um and so I can rearrange all these terms to arrive at a condition for the inflow. Q in is 2 gamma kappa L n pi A. So we just derived um, the, a condition for the inflow rate that ensures that the same amount is absorbed in every tube. Um, along this profile. Um, so this is the condition for homogeneous uh, absorption in a 1D network. Now it turns out that if you sort of take a hexagonal network and um, you, you run the simulation, you take the same boundary conditions that you have inflows and all inlet nodes and you have the same amount of outflow everywhere. Um, you, you can uh, really, no, not even fit, but you can actually um, correct this condition for the optimal flow velocity or flow rate uh, due to geometric factors that arise due to being on a hexagonal grid rather than in a 1D line. Um, but the same functional dependence holds. So it's just a, you know, dramatical uh, correction. Um, so it really generalizes to two-dimensional networks. Um, and the surprising insight here is that basically what it says, like if your network cares about supplying every cell in the tissue uh, with the same amount of goodies that are transported with the stream, then um, there is one single parameter that really is important, which is the amount of flow uh, into, into your network. And now the fantastic insight is that actually what leaves really control when 
um, is the flow rate. Because what they do is that, as I said, they have these holes, this stomatal, where the fluid is evaporating. And they can control um, how much these stomata are open or closed. And so thereby, they do control um, directly the, the flow rate um, into the leaf um, as the most important parameter to control that the same amount of goodies is supplied to all cells in the leaf. Um, and um, this was for us at the time a very, very striking um, result because we've been set up to um, basically set up this, this numerical su su uh, simulation with the aim to find, you know, what, what hierarchy of radii has to form so that every, every, uh, every cell in the tissue gets the same amount of stuff. And we're, we're looking at these, you know, hierarchical patterns of the leaves. And, and this is basically what, we're, what we have in mind when we set out and run the simulations. And then we run the simulations and it turns out that there's not much variation in the two diameters arising. Um, and, and then we look what we have, um, determines the flow, and it turns out that controlling the inflow rate is much more important than anything that you could do by basically changing the diameters of your tubes. And really, if you zoom into, um, into leaps, I mean, the, the image that you have in mind is really having these. Um, these very hierarchical patterns, right? I'm just going to take some space here. You know, this is what you have in mind when you think about the leaf. So you have these very big veins. Um, but it turns out that, um, well, this is true for the first and second order veins in the leaf. And um, if you zoom into the sort of intervein region here, this region, the tubes are very, um, the veins are very, homogeneous in diameter, and you have a very densely reticulated network with not much hierarchy. Um, so it is very likely that really this small, um, scale, at this small scale, um, supplying all the cells in, in this tissue with the same amount of, of goodies is much more important and therefore dominating this structure, whereas the bigger veins, they also serve other purposes, like for example, providing mechanical stability, and therefore they do show, um, you know, they are much thicker, but actually for the, for the concern of these small uh, space in between, they also only serve as inlets, um, where the fluid is now flowing into, at every point, into these networks, and not much absorption actually happens in the big veins, whereas all the metabolic dynamics happens on the small scale. Um, and this is, uh, I chose this example to show you that um, here's yet another perspective of how you can think about physical principles that are um, defining the, the, the structure and the morphology of, of flow networks. Um, one being like minimal dissipation, Murray's law, dating back to a century, one really looking at um, having uh, homogeneous supply by absorption. Um, there's other perspectives in the literature. You can also think about um, having homogeneous flow rates. Um, and then you sort of think about vascularity. This is what going back to Max Roper, where um, he looks at basically the blood cells that are blood cells that are um, flowing with the flow rate. And as a function of the blood cell count, you have a certain amount of oxygen being transported. So, there's, there's high variability, and uh, my take is that we need a combination of theoretical ideas that inspire what to look for, um, but also really quantitative um, observation of networks, of how they reorganize over time to dissolve the physical principles that are driving these vascular networks. Um, and as I alluded to in the very beginning of yesterday's talk, flow networks, a fundamental body block of life, um, just in ourselves. We have our arteries, we have basically the, our brain is a porous network of cerebral fluid. We have our intestine, uh, which is a tubular system, our bronchi, our lymph system, our nephron network in the kidney, and um, I could go on. These are fundamental body blocks um, of life, and um, we need to understand 
what uh, impacts their structure, and not, not yeah, just if I'm thinking of uh, vascular diseases, of how changes in the physical pro properties of the flow, flow velocities affect the morphology, and it's also inspiring to then take these physical principles and use them um, when building sort of soft robotics, for example, and you want to create functionality, um, adaptive networks, um, making decisions. Um, if you think about porous networks, like in fuel cells, um, and you want to optimize your structure for function. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Questions? Uh, so I guess by so when you said about the uh, stomata trying to control uh, the flow, um, so how how is it that they're doing it? I mean, one could imagine that it's the num the proportion of open versus closed at any given time, or is it really uh, opening and closing, and so it's some sort of an integration over time that controls the flow. Um, so the stomata are like um, for example, if you if you have a a leaf that's growing in a desert environment, it will basically just shut close uh, all its stomata during the daytime so that it avoids too much evaporation. So you can really close um, them over time or um, off time, but it seems to be that there is actually some fluctuations in time of the stomata, and they might, on a certain scale, be spatial correlated, but on other scales, um, uh, on, on a smaller spatial scale, they are correlated in space, but across the leaves, there are, there seem to be fluctuation. Uh, also, by extending your um, your your last part about absorption and this in mm -hmm. the in the whole tube, um, so could we think of the vasculature system like the like the blood flow in humans, uh, sort of having a strategy where you do not allow diffusion across the surfaces initially, but then you want to get it delivered. Uh, to the tips of the limbs, for example, and so you start uh, mm -hmm. branching it. And at the same time, instead of having one um, one sort of hierarchical structure extending to the ex to the limb, delivering trans transporting the mm -hmm. material along, you have multiple uh, such hierarchical structures emanating from, for example, the heart to yeah. going different places. Yeah. So this is uh, this is my line of thought. And there might be other lines of thought, but that you basically have one hierarchical structure that's well just getting the stuff to tissue, and then on the microvascular setting, um, where you're really providing the tissue and where the exchange with the bloodstream is taking place, you do care about the same amount being absorbed. And there's actually, uh, well, a follow -up, like follow up seems a little odd, but um, there's um, there's a new paper coming out also from the same student who did this leaf analysis that is basically going back to the same kind of equations where we looked at the vasculature in the red brain. So we had a, a tremendous data set um, where, uh, from David Kleinfeld's lab in San Diego where we had really the microstructure mapped out and not only the geometry, but most importantly, we also had the flow velocities. So we actually knew the structure and the and the boundary conditions. We could calculate the flows throughout the network. And so um, we looked at this system with the question in mind. And uh, what your brain is actually doing while we're talking is that certain regions of your brain are like the nerve neurons are firing, and they need more resources. And one mechanism that's been um, speculated is what neurons do is that they, they signal to astrocytes, these are cells surrounding the blood vessels, and these astrocytes then dilate the vessel. Like the muscles around the vessels relax, and so they dilate the tube, and uh, by uh, dilating the tube, they reshuffle um, the supply in the network. And so we asked ourselves, so how much control really resides in dilating a single tube, given that you know you have this complex network. I mean, look if you look at, the, at, at an image, it, it looks like hell, like you don't want to deal with it. Um, and, 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 and the flows like would, should change because they're globally coupled and then the transport. And it turns out that if you closely look at the dynamics of 
absorption in a tube, um, you you find that as a function of this Heckley number and this other um, parameter s, you you can find the phase space um, that tells you what can what can happen. And in this phase space, there's a regime that's dominated by diffusion and a regime that's dominated by advection. And it turns out that the rat brain vasculature is an advective regime. And this advective regime is very robust in the sense that if you dilate a tube that's in that regime, um, the, you, you really get the same increase in absorption as you dilate the tube. Like you increase, you dilate the tube by 10% and your supply, your absorption goes up by 10%. Um, and it's very robust and does not depend on the network architecture up to that tube. Only downstream you find correlations, but up to that tube, that, that selfish one tube that that is, it really gets what it puts in. Um, and, and that's, that's surprisingly robust, and based on you know, these simply, simple equations, we could also show how this arises from first principles of basically conservation of volume and, um, um, and transport of particles at network nodes. And that's been published in PL uh, at most a month ago. Michael A. Al again. The questions? I can, I can hear, yeah. yeah. I'm guessing that uh, the absorption rate is actually not constant throughout, but changes with the area and length in reality of the pipes. Like probably there are higher absorption at the thinner pipes or the venules rather than the main vents. So are there any, uh, in, in the model, the gamma is constant, but I'm guessing yeah. in reality, gamma is going to change with the tube geometry. So are there any actual scaling laws that one can derive? Because you also discussed that you have more absorption at the small veins or the thinner veins rather than the main ones. So I'm just guessing oh, that. In your vasculature. Oh, these yeah. are lines. Like these, I mean, these, um, um, the, the basically the, the, the walls are not the same um, in, your, in, the, um, in the arteries from your heart to your, your limbs. And these are, these are lined with muscles, and therefore there's no. Um, not much. They're, they're not designed for transport. They have a different physiological setup, so that's why you have different absorption. But um, if I really go through the microvasculature and I look at you know this complicated network say in the brain, it um, it seems highly complicated to assume that there's a pattern of different absorption rates across this network um, that's very finely meshed and reticulated. Um, that said. Um, we're here only looking at passive up, up, uptake, but in the in the real system, you have active channels, you have active transporters, and then you can talk about like the amount of transporters um, channels per tube uh, tube wall segment and these kind of things. So there's a plethora of um, more complicated assumptions that you could make, and you could work it out. And um, since uh, very little is known. Like the, the biggest challenge of this project uh, with the microvasculature was really to have to get any idea of what the absorption rate could be in the physiological systems. And then it's like really invoking Fermi's law, where you you take both numbers and you all jumble them together and and hope that the result is actually a good estimate because there's no such measurement. So very little is actually known about the detailed physiology of these uptakes, apart from you know there's a channel, but there's no no parameter values. So um, that my strategy is always to assume the simplest and look how far we can get and what predictions we can make that then can be, you know, sure, falsified and then you revise your, your theoretical assumptions, right? Um, but you need the experimental input first. And the idea with this kind of theoretical work is really to ignite uh, new thoughts, new experiments that then, you know, enroll this feedback between observation and and theory. Thanks. Any other question? Yeah, go ahead. So the the part of minimal dissipation networks, I didn't understand the cost function. So you mentioned that you can either work with the shear stress constant at the node, or you could have a cost function, and the two would give the same result. So, mm -hmm. but the shear stress being constant, so it looks like to me that that evolution is 
made it so that the that is how the dynamics at the node node is. But then looking at the cost function, it looks like so. Remember in the, in the previous lecture, you showed us that there's pruning when there's a lack of resources, so it becomes a tree-like structure. So what it looks like to me is that earlier there are multiple networks, but the networks which are highly efficient are the ones which stay. When so there's basically death at inefficient networks. That's what I think. And the cost function does make it look like it's a physical thing. Like the ones, the networks which are very efficient are the ones selected. But then the constant stress hypothesis I'm not able to understand because then it looks like it's chemistry that has selected. So it's not a physical thing. It's more like a evolutionary thing. The constant stress modes. Yeah. So if you want to derive the, uh, adaptation dynamics, you would start with your uh, cost function and then derive dynamics of the tubes based on that. Um, and this is what's been done. There's another, uh, let me give the reference, uh, for minimal dissipation network dynamics. There's a um, wonderful work by um, uh, Hu and Kai, so what a dynamic um, dissipation networks. Um, uh, that's Hu and Kai. It's also PRL, but I'm the Hindi here, I'm, I'm afraid. It's a... Uh, I don't know, I don't know which year, but uh, like past 20, 2010. And, uh, but I don't know, but for me it's like the, the who and Kai. Um, so I don't know the year. But, um, and they, they basically started with a dissipation network and then um, uh, derive the equations, and then there is also um, other work by Ronelin, Fitch, um, and Patifiori that is building on that. Um, there's a PRL that came out just this week, um, and uh, I believe there's an earlier one that some that takes similar uh, kind of thought that is from. Probably 2015 or 2016. I'm just writing down 2015. Again, oh, it, it's I'll still bizarre, but it's, it's only PL. <laughs> no, it's not only PLs, but it, yeah. Yeah. So, are you aware of any experiments where there have been manipulations of these organisms and this kind of, like, this minimal structure hasn't been observed? Are you aware of anything like that? So, there's one um, work on the deeper fish um, brain that. Um, at least that Kai, Kai is on it, I believe who as well, that's in class biology. Um, yeah. um, I believe it's the first author is Shen, Kai is on it, and it's class biology, um, where, they, where they looked at the dynamics and they, they say that it agrees with Maris law, um, but um, then there's this work in uh, life imaging of the trunk of the zebrafish, and, and that's from the lab of uh, Arndt Siegmann, uh, now at UPenn. Um, I don't remember the first author, but the last author is Siegmann. I believe it's a uh, uh, nature physiology. Um, and um, Arndt Siegmann defined. You can, um, where they saw um, an increase in flow rate at while the tube and the tube is the vessels uh, shrinking. Um, so I think it's just an open question um, for vasculature. The problem is so there's a whole body of work going back, and you find tons of videos on vasculature going back to um, uh, the comb and please. Um, Axel Pries, sorry, and um, Timothy Sikon. Um, there's tons of, tons of papers by those two. Um, and they say that uh, most, uh, they hypothesize that uh, most likely the dynamics of our vessels is much more intricate. And there's not only shear stress, but there's also hydrostatic pressure, and there's abundance of metabolites. These all play together. Um, and I believe the problem right now to answer this question is really that we can't um, quantify 
uh, all these parameters in live um, animal data because you can't measure pressures. And so that's why my personal strategy is to first look at slime molds um, um, and, and uh, identify physical principles there that then can be tested on other systems. And the um, pure advantage I have in, um, in Fizarum is that I can image the entire organism. And so since I can image the entire organism, I can, based on the, on the contractions that are generating the flows, I can actually measure the contractions, I can calculate the flows, the flows match the ones that I observed. And so I can not only by, via theory calculate the flows, but I also get the pressures free, for free, basically. So all of a sudden, without an experimental tool, but by imaging the entire organism, I have access to the pressures. And so I can really quantify both pressures, shear stress, um, and also like sort of invoking simulation, transport of metabolites, abundance of metabolites, and then aim to identify which is the key mechanism, uh, very much likely also something that's important for a certain dynamic. So my last question is, so this cost function, is it satisfied when there's a lot of nutrients or when like, or is it satisfied at all kinds of nutrient levels or is it when satisfied only when there's a lack of nutrients that they take this minimal strategy? So um, I can only say about, say about Vizarum where, you know, I have my own data and I quantified it. So there we see that uh, Mark's law is, um, is, is satisfied when we have, um, Basically, a network, um, and it's uh, all of a sudden it's growing like rapidly into one direction. It forms this, and like really one outlet, it forms this huge um, spillage trend. Um, and this is also in line with um, other observations where they sort of set up Fazarum and constrained it um, uh, really sterically to only have one outlet. Um, and that's worked by. I, I'm sorry, I don't remember the first source, but, but um, I believe Mark Fricker is on it, um, and it's Journal of Physics E, where they um, they've shown that Mars law in these instances uh, describes the, the structure well. So it's really like one outlet and rapid motion, um, rapid motion of fluid into that one outlet. Um, because in this data set later on, when sort of this sort of doesn't grow as much anymore, Mars law doesn't hold that well anymore. But this is this is ongoing, and I'm I'm trying to convince the student to take more data to have this statistically solid. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. All right. Uh, let's thank Karen for a very nice set of two talks coming online. Thank you, Karen.